Hello. Welcome. Welcome to this webcast on service contract design. My name is Yuvalo. We're going to spend the next, I uh, would say, hour and a half, maybe two hours. We'll see how it goes. Discussing one of the least discussed, but perhaps one of the most important aspects of modern system design. I see quite a few familiar names in the participant window. For those who don't know me, I'm a software architect. Some say the software architect because I've spent my entire career on architects, on the skills and techniques that architects need to master. 22 years ago, I founded a company called iDesign, devoted for the sole purpose of doing nothing but software design. And over the years, we've helped hundreds of companies meet their commitments and deliver great software. I've had some of the most fundamental uh, breakthroughs in modern software engineering. Some of my ideas, such as microservices, are well known. Others are less known, but I think are even more important. Before I designed in the late 90s, I was the chief software architect of a Fortune 100 company in Silicon Valley, where I managed the architecture department. Before that, I was a division architect. Before that, just an architect. I'm well into my fourth decade as a software architect. I conduct masterclasses all over the world on the techniques for architects. And these masterclasses have launched the careers of thousands of architects the world over. Virtually any company you can name and many that you cannot have an iDesign architect or iDesign trained architect somewhere uh, making sure things are done correctly. I published eight books on my ideas and techniques. This book is writing software. And the topic of today is an appendix in the book. I publish more than 100 articles on ideas and techniques. I speak and share conferences. I never worked for Microsoft, but I was privileged to be part of the strategic design effort of key products like C-Sharp and later on uh, WCF and others. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend, something they only gave to six people so far due to the impact I had on the industry over the years. And so with that out of the way, let's dive right in. We're here to talk about designing services, designing contractual services. But in order to see what that means, let's discuss a few simple questions. Suppose this is a design diagram for my system. One big thing, one giant block of code, not a single uh, uh, modulation, just one giant code. Is this a good design? Would you ever choose to have this monstrosity for your system? Now note, I'm not asking you if you've never seen this. I'm not asking you if you're not fighting it right now, but would you out of your own free will ever choose to have one big thing as your design? Imagine one function that take 25,000 arguments and then it has 5 million nested if, if, else, else, if. In theory, you can build any system in the world this way, but would you ever choose to do it this way? And the answer is, of course, no. So this is not a good design. Okay, is this a good design? Imagine a system where you have millions of things running all over the place. Virtually every line of code is in a separate method, in a separate class, in a separate service, in a separate container. Would you ever choose to do it this way? I'm not asking if you haven't seen this. I'm not asking if you haven't seen people uh, boasting very pridefully on their blogs, showing this as an example of a great design. I'm asking if you, out of your own free will, would ever choose to do it this way. And the answer, of course, is no. This is obviously a bad design. I'm sure you could do it, but it's not a good design. It is a good design. Well, at this point, you're stumped. And the reason is, asking if this is a good design is a bit of a trick question because there's not enough information in this diagram to answer it. Meaning, we don't know anything about the technology, the use cases, the requirements, the developers. And so we can't really answer the question. 
with the previous two diagrams, with this diagram and with this diagram, we can absolutely answer the question. There is enough information in this diagram to answer it. This is not a good design. But we cannot answer the question if this is a good design. However, we can absolutely say with respect to the previous two that it's better. Now, better doesn't make good. Robbery is better than murder, but doesn't make it good. So we know this is better than the previous uh, two. Now, is this a good design? And we're looking at it and we're making a face. Uh, no, this is not really a good design. Now note, I haven't changed the number of services and I haven't changed the size. And yet we all know this is not a good design. And so think about it. We know nothing about these systems and yet we know good from bad. At least we can say something is better. It must be a miracle. Well, it's not a miracle. Whenever you evaluate a design, you're always doing this in your head. You may not even be aware you're doing it in your head, but whenever you're building a system out of smaller building blocks, and the building blocks, we can call them services, classes, modules, components, it doesn't matter. You have to pay for two things. You have to pay for the cost of developing the building blocks, and you have to pay for the cost of putting them together. Now, since you can build any system in the world as a point on the spectrum between one big thing and infinite little things, Let's plot the effect of that decision on the cost of building the system. And so I have here the two elements of cost, the cost per service and the integration cost. Let's look at the curve of the cost per service, the blue curve here. And imagine a system that has just one big thing. One big thing is a unit of one on this chart. This chart doesn't start at zero. It's all defined at zero. Now imagine a system that has just one big thing. In such a system, which is way to the left of the blue curve, the cost is astronomical. And the reason the cost is astronomical is because complexity is not linear to size. Something twice as big is not twice as complex. It's not even four times as complex. It's 20 times as complex, 200 times as complex. So as the number of services decreases and by implication, the size increases, complexity explodes. Cost is not linear to complexity. Something that is twice as complex is not twice as expensive. It's 12 times as expensive. And so I'm not quite sure what is the behavior of the blue curve, but I do know that it is highly nonlinear. It could be some kind of a compounded nonlinear behavior. Now, at the same time, if I have to ask you in the one big thing, what is my integration cost? It's zero. There's nothing to integrate. It is what it is. So we have astronomical implementation cost, but we have very low next to zero integration cost. Now, if we look at the far right end of the chart, imagine a system that has millions of things running all over the place. What's the cost per service? Well, the cost per service is tiny. It's minuscule. It's a bit, it's a little service. But my integration cost is astronomical. And the reason the integration cost is astronomical is because the integration cost is not linear to the number of things that you have. If you have n things plus one to it, meaning one extra service is not plus one in cost, it's plus n because it affects all the other n. And if I keep adding it this way, at the very least it's n squared. So n squared is already not linear. The problem is that this is a very simplistic way of looking at things because as I'm plusing one and changing the other n, when I change them, they have ripple effects that affect the other things. So even if we limit the number of ripple effects to one uh, order, meaning we're not going to have second order and third order, then if I'm affecting n things, every time I'm offending one of them, it affects the other n minus one, and they affect the other n minus two, and so on. So what we have here is n times n minus one times n minus two, and so on, which we have like a factorial. And if you recall your modern algebra, you know that the order of factorial is roughly n to the power of n, which means hyper-exponential behavior. So I'm not quite sure what kind of behavior is the red line, but I know it's highly, highly non-linear. And so at the edges, the two curves completely explode. Now, since you have to pay for the two elements of cost in any given system, let's sum it up. And what you see here in dashed and green is the sum of the two elements of cost. And I did it in Excel, this is the actual chart. 
And what we can see is that we can see that any system has an area of minimal cost. And in the area of minimal cost, the services are not too big and not too small and not too many and not too few. Now, note, I'm not saying that the area of minimal cost is affordable. I'm saying you've just minimized the cost, right? Which is why you could tell me that the third diagram is probably better. We're not saying it's any good. We're saying it's just better. Now, what it means is whenever you design a system, you want to bring it to the area of minimal cost. Now, note, I'm not saying smack at the center. A bit to the right, a bit to the left is just fine. Why? Because it's good enough. For technical people, I always have to point out that good enough is by definition good enough. Now, the moment you leave the area of minimal cost, the cost starts rising up in a non-linear way. And so the moment you leave the area of minimal cost, the project is going to fail. And the reason the project is going to fail is because all organizations, the only tools they have at their disposal are fundamentally linear tools. I give you another developer. I'll give you another developer. I'll give you another month. I'll give you another month. And so if the tools that you have are fundamentally linear, but the nature of the underlying problem is fundamentally non-linear, you're never going to catch up. Projects outside the area of minimal cost have failed before anybody wrote the first line of code. It's deterministic failure. Now, this is a fundamental observation about the nature of system design. It doesn't matter how smart the developers are. It doesn't matter how good are the tools. It doesn't matter how affluent the environment and how good are the computers. None of it matters. If you're not in the area of minimal cost, the project has failed before anybody wrote the first line of code. It's a fundamental observation about the nature of projects. Which means whenever you design a system, you want to design it to be in the area of minimal cost. And so therefore we know that good services, well-designed services would be in the area of minimal cost. Now, the question is what will make a service land in the area of minimal cost? Not necessarily in the center, somewhere in the area of minimal cost. And unfortunately that is a question you cannot come up with a generic answer for. Every system is different every environment is different, every business is different. So we cannot come up and say, all services that have this color and this shape need to be here. And that's one of the problems that affects uh, uh, most developers, that they cannot have with this cookie cutter approach, here's how you do things. And so in order to uh, answer that question, we're gonna to have to do a series of reductions. So in general, in life, whenever you have a problem that you don't know how to answer, what you can do is you can do a series of transformations and a series of reductions on the original question until you come up with a question that you can actually answer. And so let's start with this series of transformations. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between services and their contracts. Now I know of course in most systems that's not the case. Why? Because we can have the same contract appearing on multiple services and we can have a single service supporting multiple contracts. But let's just assume that it's one-to-one, -one, meaning every service has one contract and it's exactly the same contract for that service and no other service has it. Now. In that case, what we have is therefore isomorphic mapping between services and contracts. Well, if that's the case, then instead of talking about the number of services and their size, I can talk about the number of contracts and their size. And so basically we're doing this kind of a transformation. And so it looks like it's the same chart, except I replace the word service with the word contract. Okay, so that's the first transformation. The next, uh, so what that actually implies is that we've converted the question from what is a good service to what is a good contract. Now, it's not exactly the same question, but intuitively understand that while it's not the same question, all we're actually doing is we're moving the charts right or left or up and down. We're not changing the fundamental behavior of the chart. And so if we're just moving it right and left and left and down and up and down, then it doesn't really matter. So it's a good reduction. So now we've converted the question to what is a good contract? Now to answer that question, we have to first answer the question, what is a contract? 
And the best way of explaining that is by looking at the human domain. In the human world, humans constantly use contracts. Now, if you look at, say, programming, in programming, we use the programming construct interface and we call it a contract. Does it mean that contracts are interfaces? Well, to some extent, but unfortunately, not all interfaces are contracts. What is going on is that contracts are formal interfaces. Now, look, for example, at the human world. Would you go and work at the company without an employment contract? You work here and that's it. Uh, probably not. Now, when you go and uh, hail a taxi in downtown, you're basically hiring the taxi driver. But do you sign a contract with the taxi driver? You're still hiring the contract, the, the uh, taxi driver, but there's no employment contract. So why? Because there is an implied informal contract there. The implied contract there is that the taxi driver is going to take, to you, take you safely to your destination that you're going to pay at the end. When you send a letter, you don't sign uh, a contract with the post office. You put a stamp on it, and there's an implied contract that the post office is going to do a best effort attempt at delivering the letter or the package. But you wouldn't rent out your apartment to a stranger without a contract. So in the human world, we make a very clean distinction between an informal contract and a formal contract. When the interaction is important, we tend to... Uh, write a contract. How many times you're trying to do some venture with somebody, some new idea, and it sounds, it sounds great. And then you say, okay, let's uh, put it down in writing. I'm doing this, you're doing that. And the other guy says, no, we don't need anything in writing. Trust me, it's going to be fine. And if you've discovered typically the hard way, this is exactly the moment in time to start worrying. If it's so simple, I'm doing this, you're doing that, then why can't we put it on a piece of paper? Okay, so in the human world, we formalize our interaction when we need to, not every interaction, we formalize it in the form of a contract. And so now I understand what is a contract. A contract is a formal interface. But you can have a good contract, you can have a bad contract. So what makes a good or a bad contract? It turns out that good contracts are facets of the entity. When a person signs Oh, so, so, so contracts are always facets of the entity. Now, when a person is signing a contract, you can have multiple contracts. You can have an employment contract, which represents you as an employee. When you're renting out an apartment, it's you as a landlord. When you're taking out a mortgage, it's you as a homeowner towards the bank. You can even have a marriage contract, in which case it's you as a spouse, right? And so, Contracts represent facets of the entity, a person as an employee, as a renter, as a landlord, as a spouse. It's a facet of the entity to the outside world, but we can have good facets and bad facets. Well, it turned out that good contracts are logically cohesive, are logically consistent. They're also cohesive and they're independent facets of the, of the entity outside world. So let, let's pass this word salad. Contracts have to be logically consistent. What does it mean? How many of you would sign an employment contract that says that you can work at this company as long as you live at that particular address over there? You would say, uh, no, I, I don't want to sign it. So if I have to move, I have to also quit. As long as I show up on time to work and I do what I'm supposed to do, then you don't care where I live. I could even live in my car and take a shower in the gym every morning. As long as I abide by the employment aspects, where I live is irrelevant. It would be logically inconsistent to include the address in the contract. Now, it's not that address is by itself a bad element in the contract. If you're looking at renting out an apartment, then I wonder if you would sign a rent contract that says, here's the rent and here's the address, but you can only rent here if you work at that company over there. You would say, what? No. So if I change jobs, I have to move. 
no, that doesn't make any sense. As long as I pay rent in time and, and as long as I keep the apartment clean and such, then you don't care where I actually make the money. Even criminals can rent. And so it's not the element itself. It's the context. The contract has to be logically consistent. Okay. At the same time, how many of you would sign an employer's contract that doesn't specify how much you're getting paid? End of the month comes along, there's no paycheck. You go to the boss, the boss says, well, I, I thought you come here because you like it. So not including the uh, amount of you getting paid or the rent in a contract would make it less cohesive. So put differently, Good contracts have to be both logically consistent and they have to be cohesive. They have evolved to include all the elements pertaining to the interaction, no more, but not less, okay? And so these are the two most important aspects, logically consistent and cohesive. But there's another aspect to it, which is the contract have to be independent facets as well. What would happen in your life if your marriage contract is dependent on your employment status? I don't know exactly what happens now in your life, but I know nothing good. The contract must be independent. Your marriage contract must be independent from your employment status. And this is why you could tell me that this is a bad design. You know, I don't care if these things are not too big or not too small. They're too coupled. They are definitely not independent facets of each other. Okay. And so it turns out that when something is both logically consistent and cohesive, there's a word for it. It's called coherent. And here's the uh, Merriam-Webster um, dictionary definition of the word coherent. It says consistent and cohesive. Now, but we said that just coherent is not good enough. It needs to be coherent and independent. So you need to design contracts which are coherent and independent. And it turns out that there is also a word for it. And the word for it is reusable. Something which is coherent and independent is reusable. What does it mean? Let's look, for example, at this big, ugly design over here. This is obviously an ugly dumping ground of everything. This kind of a contract cannot be uh, uh, logically consistent. Everything is here. But let's look at it now from the perspective of reuse. Imagine this contract that has uh, 7 uh, million uh, operations and, and, and millions of nested if and if and so on. Imagine this monstrosity. What is the likelihood that anybody else in the universe will ever need this particular contract ever again? And the answer is zero. This contract is so bloated. It is so highly specialized for its particular context. Nobody would ever reuse this contract again. This contract is not reusable. Now let's look at this diagram. And let's pick the very bottom red circle. This contract is incredibly specialized for its particular context. Beneath the green, next to the other red, at that distance from the blue, it is incredibly specialized for its context. As a result, it cannot be cohesive. Now, what is it likely that anybody else in the universe would ever need this contract again, could ever make use of it, would ever reuse it? The answer is zero. This contract is not reusable. In fact, none of these is reusable. But if we look at this diagram, every one of these things, at least there's hope. There's no guarantee, but at least there's hope. They have evolved to include all the things pertaining to the interaction that makes them cohesive, but not more than that, right? And so as a result, at least there's hope that these things are logically consistent and cohesive. They don't include more than what they need to describe the interaction, but also not less. They're both logically consistent and cohesive. They are coherent. Now, if we look at this design, you say, well, they may be coherent, 
but they're definitely not independent facets. So what is the likelihood of anybody ever using the blue contract over here with all its interaction with the yellow and all its assumption about the red? The answer is not very much. And so because it's not independent facets, it's also not reusable. So the word that binds together all of these things is reuse. So good service contracts are reusable. Now note, I'm not actually talking about the actual level of reuse. I'm not saying they are reused. I'm saying they are reusable. What we're talking about here is the potential for reuse. Whether or not anybody is reusing it is immaterial. It's, it needs to be reusable. Now, it turns out that in the human world, you judge the degree of reuse of the contract as the ultimate complement for if it's a good contract or not. For example, suppose you do want to rent out an apartment. Well, you could book an appointment with a real estate lawyer, pay hundreds of dollars an hour, and that lawyer is going to craft a contract just for you. At the same time, you can also go to Google, type apartment rent contract, get the first hit Google is giving you, print it. You don't even read the small font. You just put the address and the rent and you're done. Why are you doing it? How come we don't need a lawyer to review that contract? Because you're saying, look, a contract that is good enough for millions of other apartments why would it not be good for me? It obviously includes all the things pertaining to the interaction, like the rent and the address. Obviously, it doesn't include things like the color of my hair and where do I work, which are things that are relevant for the contract. It's obviously independent because it doesn't include any kind of provisions on employment status because at that point, nobody would actually be able to use it. So, you know, because it's good for a million other apartment, it must be good for me. How many of you would sign an employment contract if the company has crafted the contract just for you? Now, this is either very good news or very bad news. I'm pretty sure that Jeff Bezos doesn't have the same contract with Amazon as every other employee at Amazon. So it's either very good news or very bad news. And Murphy says, in our case, it's always very bad news. You could even sue the company. You could say, no, no, no. I want you to give me exactly the same contract you gave everybody else. Not what you're saying. You're not saying, I want you to give me a better contract than what you gave anybody else. I want to get the same. I want to reuse. Because if it was good for everybody else in the company, why would that be good for me? So you always, always, always judge the merit and the quality of the contract based on its degree of reuse. And that means that whenever you're factoring contracts, you always think in terms of reusable elements. You have to design them for reuse. And that is the only way to design contract. Think in terms of reuse. And again, it's the potential for reuse. It's not the actual level of reuse that matters here. And so we've transformed the question from what is a good service to what is a good contract and we transformed what is a good contract to what is reusable. And so what does it mean? How do you answer the question, what is reusable? The best way of explaining that is using an example. And so suppose you are a developer and you need to develop uh, or support the software for point of sale register. So it's a kind of a big department store and at the cashier, at the end, there's point of sale uh, registers and they take the payment and scan the items and so on. And so you say, well, what does it mean? Well, the customer wants you to connect some kind of a barcode scanner. And if you are well-versed with the iDesign method, you know that the barcode scanner is a resource to the system. And your mission here is to design a service contract for the resource access, the gray components in the method uh, diagrams. You say, well, I, I don't know anything about that. Do you have some requirements for me? Well, yes. So we have here three simple requirements. The barcode scanner need to scan individual code on the item, but not all uh, items have the same size 
of the barcode. So it needs to also adjust the width of the scanning beam to focus on a small barcode or make it wide to include large barcode. And the software needs to match communication or some kind of communication port to the scanner. And we're gonna keep it very simple, open and close the port. So you open the port, do the scan, close the port. Say, so, okay, so here's the eye scanner access contract. And literally we see here everything that uh, the requirements talked about. We have scan code, we have adjust the beam, and we have open port and close port. And we have here the barcode scanner implementing the eye scanner access. And we can even have some kind of a QR code scanner also supporting the eye scanner access. And you feel very good with yourself because clearly we have reuse here. This must be there for a good contract because you said if it's reusable and here it is, it's reused. So this must be a good contract. You feel very powerful that this is quite reusable. Sometimes later, the retailer comes to you and says the following. It says, look, we'd like to add to the system a numerical keypad. Why? Because the some of the items, the barcode is scratched and the scanner cannot really read it, but the operator picks up the item and just type the numbers underneath the barcode. That's what the numbers are for. And some of the items are so common that uh, over time, the operators, the cashier operators, know the number by heart. For the milk and the eggs or the screws, they know it by heart. And it's actually much faster for them to just type ABC123 than it is to pick up the gun, bend it to the card, scan the number, straighten up. And so this case of a numerical keypad makes more sense. Unfortunately, if you look at eye scanner access, it definitely assumed that we have here some kind of an optical device. Look, it says scan, doesn't say type, it says adjust beam. So it's very tied to the scanning notion of it. And so from a reuse perspective, the first observation we see here that it's better to abstract the actual reading mechanism. Fundamentally, you don't want to scan. Fundamentally, what you want to do is you want to read the code. Now, whether you read the code by scanning it or by typing it, doesn't matter to the computer, right? By the time you have the number, there's no apostrophe, this will scan. Nobody cares. And so which hardware mechanism is irrelevant? And so from a risk perspective, the first thing we need to do is rename it to I scanner, uh, rename I scanner access to I reader access. Okay. And we can probably even uh, rename the operation instead of scan, we can rename it to read. But we also want to make sure there's nothing there that precludes other type of readers. And of course, uh, adjust beam is, is meaningless for keypad. Now, what if we have an RFID? So there's already retailers uh, that nobody needs to scan anything. Every item in the store has a tiny chip in it. And you fill up a shopping cart, and then you just take the shopping cart out of the store. And there's basically an electromagnetic gate that just reads all of these things and you're done. So obviously there's no beam in the RFID as well. And so we need to therefore break up the original iScanner access to two contracts. And what we need to do is we need to factor down the offending operation. And so look at this case. What we have here is we have the iReader access that has the abstracted concept of reading, still has open port and closed port. And then we have eye scanner access that derives from it with the operation which is specific for the beam. So this technique is factoring down. You factor down the specialized operation. And now we have much better reuse. We have barcode scanner supporting eye scanner access and the QR code supporting eye scanner access. And that's the same as before. But now look at the keypad reader and the eye reader access. Now the keypad reader and the RF uh, reader, they can both reuse the eye reader access. So eye reader access is much more reusable than the original eye scanner access. In fact, the original eye scanner access is much closer to this. 
a giant ugly grab bag. You take everything in the requirements, you just dump it on the poor little contract. And obviously that's not reusable, okay? And whenever you see this kind of one-to-one -one transposition between requirements and a contract, you know it's not a good contract. Okay, now, sometimes later the retailer will come to you and says, look, the cash register also has a conveyor belt that moves forward the items. And we, in the old version, we had the pedal on the floor and the operator would hit the pedal with the foot and move the belt around. But we, because we scan things, we actually know the dimension of the item and we can even move it for them. So we want the software now to control the conveyor belt. You say, conveyor belt, never heard about it. What does it mean? I say, well, we've got some requirements for that. So you need to start and stop the belt and you need to manage the communication port same as with a scanner, open port, closed port. Now, while iReader Access definitely has open port and closed port, which is good, it doesn't have start and stop. In addition, reading code is meaningless, completely meaningless to the belt. And so what are you going to do now? You cannot reuse that particular uh, contract. And so whenever you have these completely unrelated operation, it's better to factor sideway. In fact, you could say that there's a long list of peripheral devices that over the course of time would come into use. Each one of these peripheral devices would duplicate different parts of different contracts. And as a result, if every time you introduce a new peripheral device, you're going to have to come up with a new contract, that would be an indication of a bad design. A good design should be resilient to changes in the user domain. So the user domain should keep changing, but the system design should not. Now, what we have here is every time there's a change by addition of a peripheral devices, the system design has to change. And that is therefore the hallmark of a bad design. The root problem is that iReader Access is really a poorly factored contract. Now, it's better than the original one, but better doesn't make good. Now, we said that good contracts have logically consistent operations. Now, look at read code in iReader Access. Read code is not very logically related to open port and closed port. Open port and closed port are much more logically related to each other than they are to read code. So whenever you have operations which are logically unrelated or are related more to themselves than to other contracts, that means that we have, again, some kind of an ugly grab bag, a dumping ground of things. So it's better to factor to the side the operations that are not logically related to what you're trying to do. Okay? And I call this technique factoring sideways. So you factor sideways when there's a weak logical relation between the operations. And so in this case, we need to factor to the side the port management operations. So let's come up with another contract called our communication device. And our communication device represents just the facet as a communication device. And we're going to put open port and closed port. Our reader access now only has the things pertaining to reading the code. And similarly, we can have I belt access with start and stop pertaining only to the facet as a belt. Now, since a service can implement multiple contracts, look at the barcode scanner. Barcode scanner now needs to support two contracts, I scanner access and I communication device. Now, look at it from the perspective of the developer charged with implementing barcode scanner. The sum of work inside barcode scanner is exactly the same. You're not doing any more work. However, now the conveyor belt can now reuse the air communication device contract. So now we have reuse. And reuse is the indication of a good or a better contract. Now, sometimes you have the reverse problem. Sometimes you have operation which are logically related they're definitely part of the contract, but they are required in other unrelated contracts. And now you have a problem. 
if you don't include them, you make the contract less cohesive because they're absolutely required for the description of the contract. If you do include them everywhere, you're just bloating and repeating things. So that's not good. For example, in the case of the register, support for safety, you have to add an abort operation on all devices. Now, what do we need an abort on the laser gun? Imagine a kid is picking up the laser gun and zapping the eyes of the brother or the sister with a laser gun. Probably not so good. Now, we definitely want an abort on the laser gun, but how about the conveyor belt? Imagine somebody's hair is caught up in the conveyor belt. So you need to have some kind of a big red button that you hit the big red button and everything stops. And so from that perspective, aborting is as much a scanner operation as it is a belt operation. So what are you gonna do? Put a bolt everywhere? How about diagnostic? You need to run a diagnostic and see if the peripheral devices are in good state. And so diagnosing the belt is very important for the belt, but diagnosing the uh, scanner is also a very important operation. So what are you going to do? So whenever you have operation which are logically consistent, but they are repeated, you need to factor up. And so look here at iDevice control. iDevice control is going to be a base contract containing all the operation which are logically related but they're repeated. And now we have the iReader access deriving from it and the iBelt access. And now you reuse the contract because you put it upstairs. Now, if you think about it, I just showed you three very simple techniques. You factor down, sideways, or up. That's it. That's all the techniques you need to know. And when you're working on these contracts, you constantly ask yourself the question, is what I'm looking at, is it logically consistent? Is it cohesive? Is it an independent facet? You literally verbalize to yourself and ask these questions. However, there's a problem. I did not show you any technique that creates larger contracts. The three techniques I showed you all result in smaller and smaller and smaller contracts. And the downside here is that if you keep doing it, you will keep ending up with smaller and smaller and more fractured contracts. And at the end of the day, you have an explosion of contracts and we know that's a bad design. So how do you know when to stop? How do you know it's good enough? And to answer that, you need to use metrics. And it turns out that you can look at any system and very easily sort out the better contract from the worse contracts. And in fact, uh, there's lots of techniques for doing it. And I've been doing it for many, many years. In fact, every system I ever designed, I always measured the contracts and I always sorted them. For example, I can go to your source control system and let's assume for simplicity's sake that contracts are mapped one-to-one -to, -one to services. If it's not, it just means more work. It doesn't change the nature of the work. And I would simply look at the following metric. I would see which contract um, is reused the most, but I would balance it against how many times it would checked out and changed. So obviously, if I have a contract that is reused in hundreds of places in your system, but nobody has ever changed, that's a great contract. At the same time, if I have a contract that's used in exactly one place, but every day people are changing, that's your worst contract. And this is just a product, so I can just sort the best from the worst. How about I would look at the underlying cyclomatic complexity of the implementing services. It's very unlikely that you're gonna have a really clean, simple implementation of a monster contract. It's very unlikely you're gonna have a simple code base that has millions of little contracts. So I can just measure cyclomatic complexity and sort all the contracts based on the underlying services. How about number of defects in your defect tracking system? If you have big bloated services, I bet there's lots of defects there. I would also look at how many developers worked on something. I would look at how many times something was checked in or checked out. So there's lots of ways of actually doing it. And I can also add a timeline here and show how something getting better or worse over time. And I've been doing it for decades, for decades, plural decades, I've been measuring contracts. And it turned out that regardless of the technology, the system, the domain, the developers, the tool set, there were 
incredibly uniform metrics for good contracts. So let's cover these metrics. A contract with just one operation is possible. It compiles, you can deploy it, but you really shouldn't have it. Why? If contracts represent a facet of the entity to the outside world, it must be a pretty dull facet if the only thing you can say about it is one operation. It's a big red flag. Maybe it's got too many parameters. Sure, I can have 20,000 parameters in one operation. So that's obviously not a good design. We know that. Maybe it's too coarse. Many times you would find customers describing, describing some kind of a business behavior, but they actually concatenate it. So it's two or three use cases fused together. And logically, they're actually separate. So break it down. Sometimes it's too granular. Sometimes you have a facet that is different from other facets, but it's just one operation. Now, in which case, maybe you should bump it upstairs. In fact, what I find is that whenever you have contract with one operation deriving from another contract, you will never have the base contract as is. You always have the subcontract. So you know, just make it one contract. Sometimes you have something that belongs in another phase or another version of the system, and you're trying to do it here in isolation. No, do it with its uh, family when it's time to do it, right? So I cannot tell you what corrective action to take, but I can tell you a contract is one operation is a big red flag. Go and investigate. What's a good number? Three to five. Doesn't mean six is bad. No, I guess it's okay. None, it's a lot. 12 is horrible. No more than 20. What you see here is a range that keeps almost desperately becoming less tolerant. Why? Because the underlying behavior is not linear. What does it mean? If you're showing me a contract with 20 operations on it, I'm throwing it out. If, you, if I'm doing your design review, I'm throwing it out. I don't care. I don't even want to look at it. You have failed. No contract with 20 operation is ever going to be a good contract. Now, between you and me, the practical number is about 12. What does it mean? It means if I'm doing a design review and I see 12, I'm most likely going to throw it out, but I'm at least listening while you have this monstrosity. At 20, I'm not even listening. What's well, a good number? Three to five. And it turns out that you as humans view it exactly the same way when it comes to your contract. How many of you would sign an employment contract with a company that has one line? You work here. Would you sign that contract? You wouldn't sign it. And the reason is there is no way that one line would be enough to capture the correct interaction because in one line, you can't say, okay, suppose somebody died because of the code. Am I liable? Is the company liable? If I invent something, who owns it? Am I owning it? The company is owning it? There's no way of capturing it with just one line. At the same time, how many of you would sign an employee's contract that has 2,000 pages in it? You would not sign it. How about 200 pages? You're not going to sign it. The only purpose of... 200 pages contract is to mess you up, is to screw you. You probably are not even going to sign 20. I mean, do you really need 20 pages to describe the interaction? You know, if you need 20 pages to describe it, you're probably going to fail in that job. Any job that requires 20 pages to describe the interaction is a job you're going to fail at doing. The only purpose of 20 pages is to say, ah, on page 17, subparagraph 3, article 8, we said you're going to do that, and you didn't. Ha, ha, ha. That's not a good setup. Now, suppose I'm giving you a contract with three pages, maybe five pages. I'm not saying you're going to sign it a priori because it's three pages, but at least you're going to give it a good read and decide. So you yourself view the size of the contract being too big or too small as an immediate indication of how good is the contract. And so this is a very nice uh, analogy to the software world. Another interesting uh, metric that I find is that you should avoid property-like operations. And the reason is properties are actually bad. Now, I know you all use properties, but I hope you're not using it because you think properties are good. Properties are better than public member variables. 
that they are, but better does not make good. It turns out that properties are bad. And the reason properties are bad is because they always imply state implementation. And by doing so, they betray the thing you should have encapsulated and create coupling. Why do I need to know how many hairs your dog has? I want it to bark. I want it to fetch. I don't care how it's doing it because the more I know about the entity, the more I'm coupled to it, the more I'm coupled to it, the more uh, uh, I'm affected by it and the more it changes, I change. I don't want to go there. So you really don't want to have properties. And this explains something that, uh, I, mean, I don't know if you actually noticed over the last uh, 25, 30 years, that properties are not always present. So if you look, say, at COM, the first component technology, COM did not have properties. Now, when Anders Hausberg designed .NET, C Sharp and .NET did not have properties. But the VB team came holding hat, hat in hand to Anders Hausberg and said, look, uh, our users are doing get and set all day long. If you're not going to have properties, they can't do anything. And so to pacify them, they added get set to .NET, not because it's a good idea. WCF comes along. In WCF, there's no properties. Why? Because properties are bad. A good interaction should be behavioral, not uh, stateful. Now, you can easily circumvent it. If your technology does not allow you to have properties, suppose you want to have a name property, but the technology doesn't allow you, then you add two operations, get name and set name. It compiles, it works. I call these things property-like operations. Really, really bad idea. Don't do it. They imply state, they imply implementation. The more I know, the more I care, the more I care, the more I'm coupled to you, the more I'm coupled to you, the more you change, I change. Let's not go there. And this is also reflecting something from the human world. In the human world, if you have control over things, which would you rather do? Tell people or ask them to do something? It's obviously much better to tell than to ask, okay? In life in general. And you always want to restrict your contracts to behavioral things. Do something, do operation not state, not properties, really bad idea. Now, I can also give you other metrics which are somewhat empiric. The first metric is how many contracts a service tends to have. And of course, many systems, I find that number to be 2.2. .2. Now, that number is a bit misleading because it depends on what you're actually measuring. If you look at the evolution of software, the most primitive form of software is a program. Above that, we have a system. Above a system, we have a platform. Above a platform, we have a fractal. So as you move up this food chain, the number of contracts tends to increase. So a system is going to have more contracts per services than a program. So this number is for a system. Okay? In the... Uh, Platform, you tend to have slightly higher number, and in the contra in the fractal, even slightly higher than that. Another number that I find is that operation tends to have 0 0.7 parameters per operation. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. If it's all about behavior, I don't need to even tell you how to do it, because the more I tell you, the more I'm coupled to it. So you actually want to have very few parameters, less than one on average. Now note that if you comply with the metrics, it doesn't mean you have a good design. If you're violating them, it means you have a bad design. What does it mean? If you look, say, at uh, iScanner Access, our original example, it has four operations. And four operation is beautifully in the center of the area of three to five. So you say, okay, I got four, therefore it's a good design. No, 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 no. If you meet the metric, it doesn't mean at all that you have a good design. If you violate the metric, it means you have a bad design. That's the right way of looking at it. And I can tell you that I've measured even platforms. When .NET first came out, I used the flexion to measure all the interfaces in .NET, and I measured 2,000 interfaces. And .NET had three to five, meaning if you look at the histograms, the prevalence of three and four and five was basically the same. 
had three to five uh, operations and it had uh, two or so contract per service and so on, or per uh, class. And so when .NET 2.0 came along, I wanted to see if they actually changed things and measured it and actually added 200 new interfaces, but the numbers didn't change. So you could say in that case that .NET, at least when I measured it, was properly factored. Now, the ideas of contract factoring are simple, but they are far from simplistic. What does it mean? Life is full of simple ideas. Here's a simple idea. I want to be rich. Is it simplistic? Well, obviously not, because otherwise everybody would be rich. What does it mean to be rich? You have to work hard. You have to study something difficult. You have to take risk, be nice to your boss, whatever it takes. It's not simplistic. Here's another simple idea. I'd like to be healthy. It's a very simple idea. Is it simplistic? No. You got to eat right. You got to exercise, maybe take some drugs, lower your stress, change your lifestyle, in fact. That is required to be healthy. So life is full of ideas which are simple but not simplistic. And the problem is, what I showed you are really, really simple ideas. I didn't show you anything complex. This is really down to earth, approachable, simple. The problem is, it is very, very, very time consuming to do. This is especially the case with the junior hand of point. So recall from the architect's masterclass that the hand of point is where the architect ends and developers begin, where architecture ends and detail design begin. And that point depends on the level of maturity and competence of developers. Senior developers can do detailed design, can do the work I just showed you. Junior developers have no idea. They would come up with one big thing that has everything on it and think nothing of it. And note, I'm not saying that junior developers are the ones with few years of experience. No, this is regardless of years of experience, okay? We've all seen those senior developers creating these monstrosities, never thinking anything of it. Well, they have lots of years of experience as say junior developers. And so when you, when you have just junior developers, then you can't trust them with doing it right because they will do it the worst possible way. They would instantly deviate from the area of minimal cost. And the moment that happens, the project will fail before anybody wrote the first line of code. And that's really bad. Now, suppose your system has 10, 20, 30, 40 services. Suppose you have 40 services. Suppose it will take you a week to perfectly nail down the contract in a way that will never change from now to the end of time. You just added 40 weeks to the project if all you have is architects, the junior developers. And that's really the problem. It's the fact that it is so time consuming on one hand, and the fact that the vast majority of developers lack the skills of contract factoring. In fact, um, I used to say the senior developers, the junior developers, I'm now much more disillusioned. My default statement on any company is, it's always a junior hand of point. Yes, we can train them, we can make sure they do it right, but that's not the initial state. Developers lack factoring skills the most. They like it much more than basic architecture. Architecture is actually fairly easy. I can give you a template, do it in layers, encapsulate its volatility, that's your architecture. It's not a big deal. But there's no formula for how to come up with the contract uh, design specific for your system. That doesn't work. And developers just don't know how to do it. The most pervasive reason for failure for even well-architected system is the incorrect hand of point, where the architect comes with the right architecture, hands it over to developers, and then developers butcher everything because the contracts are not in the eye of minimal cost. Then that point, what's the point of having architecture? The vast majority of organizations and people do not recognize the value or even the feasibility of contract design. They don't understand it. They don't know they need to do it, and they don't know how to do it, even if they recognize that they need to do it. That's how bad it is. Even if you try and explain that, they will say, well, everybody knows it's impossible. Okay, so that's a logical fallacy. The fact that they do not know how to do something doesn't mean it cannot be done. It just means they don't know how to do it. This is a logical fallacy of confusing absence of evidence with evidence of absence. It's not the same. I was once on a project where I spent three and a half months to myself talking about contracts and drawing it and cohesive and logical consistent. And from the corner of my eye, I could see the managers clawing the walls. 
They would all say, I don't understand what this is taking for so long. Scan, bark, fetch, whatever it is. Why is it so uh, prolonged? Do you want me to do it? And I would say, Shh, I know. I know you don't understand. That's why I'm doing it. Don't expect ever your manager to support you in doing it. Don't expect your developers and taking the time before they jump headfirst into an empty swimming pool with code to work on the contract. They're just not going to do it. This will be an uphill struggle. The issue here is not in doing it. Doing it is not just easy. It's liberating. It's creative. It's exhilarating. You literally can envision how these things are going to be fantastic. But everybody's going to be fighting you. They're all going to make excuses. Everybody knows it's impossible. And nobody ever does it this way and such. Yeah, okay. And so you have to accompany your data design with conviction. If you think that something is the right way of doing it, then you do it because it's the right thing to do, not because somebody gave you permission for doing it. I cannot stress it enough. In life, you do the right things because of the right things to do. Now, if you disagree with it, at the end of that statement lies the admission, I was just following orders. And I was just following orders we know is not a valid defense in any court. So if the boss told you to do something bad and you did it, that's on you. That's not on the boss. That's how life really works. Every single one of you must be able to go to the boss and say with a straight face, trust me or fire me. Look, if you trust me, then stay out of my way. Let me do my damn job. If you don't trust me, why are you paying me? Why are you paying me? Now, it's an illusion that you think there's anything in between. You think there's a quasi state between trust me and fire me. There isn't. There isn't any quantum state in between. It's binary. If you don't have the courage of your conviction, don't enter the kitchen. Definitely involve education. Definitely explain that the alternative is perpetual refactoring. You have all seen ad nauseum projects that for years people were re 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 refactoring. And all they're doing is creating more misery. Refactoring never ends up with anything good. Isn't perpetual refactoring an indication of perpetual inability of ever getting it right? In which case, why even engage it in the first place? Perpetual refactoring is orders of magnitude, orders, plural, more expensive, time consuming, and demoralizing than doing it right in the first place. Nobody likes to work on a giant ball of mud. Refactoring tends to degrade quality because what developers do is they fix something locally over here at the expense of destroying the rest of the system. I can categorically tell you the follow. Those that do not invest in digital design live to regret it, either immediately or eventually, but they will live to regret it. Not optional. Another thing that makes it both uh, a challenge and an ingredient for success, you have to involve the business and a domain expert in the digital design. Now, it's obvious that we have to involve the business and a domain expert when it's time to do architecture. As architects, we know how to do architecture, but we don't understand the nature of the business. We don't understand the core use cases and such. And so we have to eat, interact with a business expert. But the same is true with contract design. Now, unlike architecture, data design is very time consuming. We know from the architect's masterclass that you can produce a world-class architecture that will be good practically forever in a matter of a few hours to a few days. It's not very time consuming. But data design is very time consuming because the devil is in the details. Data design can take weeks, can take months. And it's also intermittent. You work a little bit and then you have to do something else in order to figure out what the next thing you have to do to design. And then you go back and you undo something. And business people tend to be busy people, right? The word busy in business is almost the same. And if you have a busy business person, they are unlikely to commit to spending weeks to months with you. And in addition, they absolutely hate that sometimes you need them, sometimes you don't. But I can tell you they have to. You have to, they have to understand that digital design is a collaborative effort between the business and the IT. It's not just up to the IT guys. And if they want to actually 
avoid the future pain coming the way that will allocate the time. In fact, you need to make that time commitment explicit. If you want me to design this, I need that one or maybe several business experts to make that commitment. So when I say something, they drop what they're doing and the ongoing until we're done here. Even better, have a dedicated domain expert assigned to you. And that's their job. Their official job is to be the domain expert assigned to you. They're not visiting customers. They're not writing documentation. They are assigned to you. You have to decide to understand that contract design is an iterative process, like all design effort. You always design iteratively, but you build incrementally. And so as you iterate, you go from some nebulous ideas eventually to results. And so don't try to get the contract right in the first pass. Nobody can. I've never gotten design right in the first pass. You iterate over it as you improve it. Now, definitely tie the contract back to the architecture. So you don't design the contracts in the void. You have an architecture. You have to break down into components and layers and, and, and services and such. You also have a vertical slide that shows how all of these things work together as far as your hosting, your security, transaction, queuing, and so on. And so you tie the contract back to the vertical slice. Here's the interaction between these things. How does that work? What does it tell me about the contracts that I already have? Constantly ask yourself, is it logic consistent? Is it cohesive? Is it independent facet? Maybe it belongs in this subsystem as opposed to that subsystem. You literally have to ask these three questions out loud. Constantly ask these questions. Now, any decent system is not going to have just one service to do. It's not even going to have just, you know, three or four, maybe 10. You're going to have several subsystems. And so there's a classic mistake of taking a subsystem and then completely polishing it or taking even an individual service and polish it to perfection, moving on to the next service. Don't do it. What you want to do, you want to look at the entire landscape of all your services across subsystems and iterate over all of them and bringing them together to the same level of maturity. So you start with some ugly grab bag. So everybody's just ugly grab bag. Then you factor it a little better and you constantly bring it together. And the reason you want to have them at the same level of maturity horizontally and not polish one of them vertically to perfection is because the nature of the design is iterative and you're not smart enough to figure out how all these things interact. And there's going to be some downstream decision, invalidates an upstream decision, and it's going to cause you a lot more iteration, a lot more rework. But by bringing them together to the same level of maturity, mean you minimize the amount of rework you have to do and you're doing it the most efficiently. It's important during detailed design to initiate another round of interviews. Now, these interviews, you interview the same people, the business people, but you ask different type of questions. With architecture, you're trying to uncover the nature of the business, the core use cases. With detailed design, you uncover the behavior of the business. How are we supposed to do this nature? It's also important to be active. Detailed design is a super active activity. And uh, every time they tell you something, you reflect back to them. So I understand this is what you want me to do. Don't go quietly into the night with some misunderstanding. That would be the worst time to do it. Understanding never lands on your lap on a silver platter. Nobody would ever give you, rise mighty architect, here's the behavior we want to do. For the very simple reason that the business people do not understand the business. And certainly they don't understand all aspects and they don't understand all aspects of the level that you need to understand to do this design. And so you have to be active. You have to milk these things out of them. You have to force them to think about it in ways that they are not used to think about, okay? Sometimes you're gonna hit a block. You're gonna say, okay, I know this is bad, but I don't know to make it any better. Go and ask for somebody's input, okay? Even uh, 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 I've seen many times that when you hit a block, it's because there's a glaring inconsistency in what the business is trying to do. And it reflects in an impossible digital design on your part. So you go back to the business people and you say, look, I, I, I can't do it this way. What is it? And I say, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's wrong. Okay, let's think what we should do here. Okay. So that even they actually benefit from it. It's also important never to design to the metrics. 
don't say, okay, this contract, uh, I need to design for four members. No, you never design for the metrics. Metrics are an indication. They are not the result, okay? So it's true with anything, right? We know that uh, the normal body temperature of somebody is uh, 36.9 centigrade. Well, the fact that they have this temperature doesn't mean they're okay. No, they're not okay. And so you don't design for the metric. There's nothing wrong with starting with several massive contracts on explosion of smaller contract. At least you have a list of all the operation you will ever need. Start with that. And then iterate, factor up, down, sideways, right? And only at the end to see how well you land with respect to the metric. It's also a good idea to make the iterations overly explicit. Suppose you need to go from A to B, from B to C. And you already know at A that you should go to C and you're tempted to skip over B. Don't do it. This is a bad idea. Definitely go through the B. First of all, assuming that you can uh, uh, go to C is hubris. It's arrogance. It's thinking that you know what you're doing. Approach digital design with humility. Go through the motion. Make sure you understand it correctly. In addition, I've never done digital design surrounded by people that knew about digital design. And so you have to constantly educate them about what you're doing. If you just jump to the C, to the end uh, uh, result, it looks like magic to them. How did you know it's C? What did you have to do? So by going through the intermediate state steps, you educate them. You add value to what you're doing. They get to verify. They get to provide feedback. It's good. Another technique is sketching. Don't be afraid. Start by sketching. Start by naming contracts. I my contract. I feel like the name. What does it mean? I don't know yet. Draw interaction diagrams. And so the interaction diagrams initially start service A calling service B, service C, and such. But the interaction diagrams are in place to clarify. And so you start by just calling an interface. You don't even know what the uh, operations are like. And then you can put some operation names on it. And you iterate over the sketches and the diagrams. By sketching, I actually mean you can literally open up Visual Studio and, and start typing interface, I, my service. Okay, let's start putting operations on it. Let's see what that looks like. And you iterate over the sketches and the diagrams. Very quickly by sketching, you, you identify missing contracts sometimes, missing operations, obviously. And you constantly try and validate the use case. So I have this required behavior. Let me put together my building blocks that I've sketched together here using these operation and this contract. Let me see if I can put it together to satisfy each of the use cases. And obviously, if I can't satisfy a use case, then something is wrong with my uh, design. And as you start doing it, the contract are completely off, the operations are off, the use cases are a mess. And so everything affects everything else and there's a lot of churn going on. And you keep the sketching until basically the churning subsides and it's more or less stable and you can validate the use cases and things don't change. As you design a large system, you're gonna have to uh, visit this subsystem and that, that subsystem and such. And sometimes you're gonna spend a few days, maybe a few weeks on the subsystem. And then you're going to go and spend another week or two or maybe a month on another system. And then you have to jump back to the other one. And the problem now is that you have to put yourself in the design mindset you were in a month ago. And it's incredibly expensive. Now, you still have to do it. But when you're jumping around, try and capture the current state. Here's why we think this is the right operation. Document your line of thinking. Document the rationale behind the decision. Definitely make design integrity and consistency a priority. Now, integrity and consistency is above uh, coherence and reuse. I could have a bunch of contracts. They're all incredibly reusable, but they're all different. These take this style, these take that style. That's probably not a good idea. The contract need to have uh, integrity, they need to have consistency. They need to look the same, but they also need to work together, which is another level uh, of the integrity, meaning uh, about being reusable. Because yeah, it's reused in isolation, but when as soon as I put the other things, it's not. That's not good. It needs to have integrity. Now, I know it's a lot to capture. I know it's a lot to uh, think in, but I can tell you something else. The best and only practical way of learning contract factoring is from someone that already knows how to do it. 
you're not going to be able to learn it by which, watching uh, YouTube clips or by playing along with your Visual Studio. You have to see somebody that knows how to do it and that somebody has to mentor you and perhaps other people. And the mentorship is about the techniques. And I showed you the techniques, but the mentorship is all about the process. Here's how we go from A to C. Here's the stepping stones. Here's how we do it. You have to adopt the right mindset. It's daunting. It's almost like panic when you have to start designing 40 services. So you come down. Here's a technique. I don't know what it would look like, but I know we have a process for getting there. You have to understand what the diagrams need to look like. What is too much detail or too few details in the diagrams? What does validation look like? Yeah, so support the use case. Does it mean it's really supported or it's sort of supported? What does it mean? How do you know it's validated? Unless you've seen somebody doing it, you're not going to get it right. Now, this is absolutely an acquired skill. I've taught these skills easily to more than 100 senior architects on a personal basis. And I can tell you, everybody gets it when you show them how to do it. But if you don't show them how to do it, what do you expect them to actually get it? It's just not going to happen. And so let me end this by going over a sample project where you have all of these techniques. The background of this project, it's a first of a kind groundbreaking large initiative. And by I'm saying first of a kind, it is truly first of the kind. It is world changing. It has the potential of affecting every one of your lives. It's doing something that has never been done before. Now people have been talking about doing it for more than 20 years, but nobody has ever attempted of doing it. And in most places in the world, deploying the system is actually considered illegal. That's how first of a kind it is. Now, at the same time, it's the only uh, hope we have. The development phase is 18 months start to finish. The project is highly multidisciplinary. It involves aspects of finance at a very high level. We're talking uh, a lot of microeconomics and trading and such. It involves economics, fundamental economic laws, economic theories and such. It involves uh, a very high level of physics and we're not talking simple physics. We're talking like physical chemistry and electricity and such and material science. It involves classic engineering, uh, system engineering. It has very daunting technological aspect as far as software. It is dealing with psychology and it has to deal with a ton of politics and regulations. Now, there's uh, other attribute. This system is mission critical. If this system fails, people could actually die. And at the very least, many people are going to be very unhappy. So the moment you have this kind of system, you know you can't have any uh, mistakes. It also has to interact with a collection of legacy systems. All of these legacy systems are at some point of collapse as we speak right now. It has to interoperate with this legacy system, has to interoperate with other systems that are trying to do similar things. It also involves bleeding edge systems, both in software and hardware. These bleeding edge systems, some of them uh, are barely out of research papers as far as what can be done and what cannot be done. And to top it off, we're talking about drastic volatility. Every deployment of the system is gonna be completely and utterly different. Every locale is going to have different regulation, different legacy, different interoperability requirements. Every locale is going to have different scales. The system can be deployed at a very small scale and at, uh, let's call it, uh, massive global scale. All of this, and it, it has to basically scale from the smallest to the largest possible. This is the making of this project. The project has four large stages. It has a use case and architecture phase, has uh, digital design and technology phase, construction phase, integration with uh, customers. As far as the use cases, the system was given no use cases and there's also no users because remember it's first of a kind. The only thing the designers got was a single core use cases that involved two words. So the only thing that was known about the system is two words. 
And so the design team started by producing over 100 activity diagrams describing two out of four subsystems. The overall architecture has four subsystems, and those subsystems are actually arranged in a fractal. And out of those two words, I came up with 100 activity diagrams describing two of the subsystems. And each one of these things, I would say even uh, uh, most of them were open-ended, meaning there could be endless variation. It could look like this, though. And a core requirement here is for the customer to customize the use cases. And so because uh, of the incredible diversity in local regulation, deployment and such, the system has to allow customers post-deployment to customize and change the behavior of the system. And to make it even more challenging, the system will change the behavior of the users. So the way that the system, that the users use the system will change because of the introduction of the system itself, which means the system will have to change itself as a result of the system. The architecture aggregates the systems in a tree-like manner. So it's actually not a single system. It's a system of systems. The systems are arranged in a tree-like manner that has a natural hierarchy, but conceptually it's a fractal that has no beginning and no end. Think of like the internet. The internet obviously is finite, but conceptually there's no beginning and end to the internet. And each node in this tree has four subsystems. Now, each level in this tree has absolute self-similarity. What is absolute similarity? Meaning, if I'm looking at the very smallest or the very largest, they look exactly the same. They use the same contracts. They use the same uh, composability and such. And if you think about it, it has to be this way. Because if every layer in this tree is different, nobody can code it. The only fighting chance the team has here is if there is absolute self-similarity. We do it once, you do it for everything. And of course, the system uses the ID zone method uh, in every uh, subsystem. So the usual uh, structure or managers, engines, this is access and so on. To make it even more challenging, there is no ready-made technology for doing this system. The software technology for building this system does not exist today. The system requires high level of distributed transactions. And we're talking absolutely distributed transactions, but in a global scale. It requires reliable messaging. The system has to have perfect reliability. And as we all know, if you use things like HTTP, that's not reliable. It requires message security, because as we all know, HTTPS is not secured. And by the way, reliability and security is hardcore requirement of the first customer. And they absolutely know uh, the problem of reliability and security. The system requires uh, discovery at every level where the system uh, boots, it actually discovers all the software components and they all basically compose themselves on the fly. It requires a message bus for interacting between components in subsystem and across layers in the tree. It requires executing long running workflows, meaning imagine a method that actually needs to execute and even change itself over the course of several months. It requires massive, massive concurrency. We're talking, like I said, global scale. Imagine all the people in the world using this system at the same time. And the system needs to process ungodly amount of concurrent data. And it needs to work both offline and disconnected or online and connected. It needs to be deployed in the cloud and on-premise. So the team also had, on top of everything else, to develop the technology to build the system in the first place. So the first thing the team did is develop technology, not develop the system. The team, or the, we had a detailed design team there and had the following uh, making. There was one senior architect that was also a domain expert, another senior architect that was a technology expert, two junior architects, uh, senior developers, and one uh, dedicated domain expert. The team, the design team, was ge geographically spread across Europe and the US East Coast and West Coast. And so, as you can imagine, time zone was a big issue. The domain expert, Involvement proved 
absolutely instrumental. There is no way the design team could have done it without the vetting of the domain experts. And throughout the process, across literally every interface from day one, the domain experts validated and refined uh, the use cases with the design team. The design uh, team followed the process whose objective wasn't necessarily to nail down every last aspect of every last contract. The objective was to remove digital design as a risk out of the project, meaning digital design should be uh, done to a level that developers can actually start working and any change they have to do at this point would not have any ripple effects. Everything is going to be localized. The design team started by laying out the use cases in activity diagrams, like I mentioned. And there was a hundred pages document for the first subsystem, another hundred pages for the second subsystem. There's actually four subsystems, but these are the most uh, important subsystems. And then they validated the architecture with a hundred sequence diagram for the first two subsystems. And then they did activity diagrams um, and 80 sequence diagrams for the other two subsystems. So once the first two subsystems were more or less in the clear, they could do uh, a bit more work and also clarify the other two subsystems. The initial validation was mostly done uh, in PowerPoint. So initially they laid out some sketches and then they did interaction diagram in PowerPoint to show that this interaction support a particular use case. And occasionally uh, jumping into Visual Studio to demonstrate a particular point that was easier to demonstrate in Visual Studio than in PowerPoint. And the interfaces were all initially sketched as, as grab bags of operation, ugly grab bags. And then iteratively through this process, they cleaned up each subsystem, bringing them to uniform level of maturity and constantly validating against the use cases. They did multiple passes and by multiple, I mean easily several dozens because there were significant ripple effects. They would change one interface on one contract on one subsystem. It had ripple effects on the other subsystems. Also, as they changed some things, as they uh, uh, validated, they had new insight. That new insight affected some of the previous design. And that happened across all subsystems. And so it was important to bring them on par across all subsystem at the same moment in time. And progressively, more and more of the work wasn't done in Visual Studio. And sometimes there were things you had to flash out in diagrams, especially things that involved non-localized things. So if there's an interaction involving multiple services or multiple subsystem, it's really difficult to see it in code, but if you do a diagram, it's a lot easier. Throughout all of this, the design team did not write a single line of code. The focus here was solely on digital design and use case analysis. And because they avoided code, it was crucial in having very quick iteration. If you're working on something wrong, you know it's wrong very quickly and you produce these clear, consistent, cohesive, reusable interfaces. The scope of the design work was exactly four months of the day. All of it was done remotely over 36 uh, conference calls. They lasted 126 uh, hours and 630 work hours. Average call was three and a half hours in length. And then they added 12 hours uh, at the end for overall review of everything, soup to nuts. The scope of the design, they have created 47 contracts. There's additional eight contracts with the operation. These are placeholders. If certain aspects mature into a facet, that's a place they're going to go. So everything has a home, even things they don't know about or that are questionable. A total of 145 operations. And they also invested in user experience, not because it was uh, part of digital design, but because the user experience drove some of the uh, outward facing contract. And so they wanted to see what user experience would look like. And so they developed personas of the users in a 20 pages document. And they prioritized the perspective of the user and what they want to see and did some wireframe and that helped drive some of the contracts as well. Here's some metrics for you. There was 2.65 uh, contracts per service. And I told you already that um, this is uh, a slightly high number because this is actually a fractal. And so the number of contracts per service tend to creep up. 
here's a heat map that shows uh, contract per service. And the heat map was very useful in identifying outliers because as you move things around and you look at how many contracts per service, obviously it needs to be balanced. So if you have one service supporting 20 contracts, that's obviously not a good idea if everybody's supporting two contracts. And so the heat maps help to identify where to go and zoom in and say, okay, why do we have this bloated? And maybe it's because we haven't looked at that subsystem yet. And so these 14 contracts, we need to break it down into these groups that have these uh, support over here and so on. As far as interface reuse, uh, by the time the effort was done, it was only 1.61, but there was a ton of demo services. You can see there are about 35 of them that basically stood up everything. And so the script cal calculating it uh, came up with this number. But if you eliminate the demo services, uh, it was 2.1. And remember the metric I gave you was 2.2. So that was pretty good. Here's operation per interface, and it was uh, 3.09 operation per interface on average. As far as parameter per operation, 0 0.79, pretty much as expected. But note also um, how many operations there are with no parameters at all. Some design uh, attributes. All operations were behavioral in nature. There's exactly zero properties or property-like operations. So imagine this very complex charging system, not a single property. Not a single operation corresponds to a feature. Now, we know from the Arctic's masterclass that you don't do functional decomposition and that features are the aspect of the integration, the composability. And so a very good case of composable design where the features are the result of the composability of the services. A year later, there's still no changes to the contracts. Now, this is even after an intermediate pivot that the team had to do to uh, take an opportunity with uh, uh, a first early adopter. And so in spite of that, still no changes to the contract. Now, I know it's almost overwhelming and I'm not suggesting that everybody should do this kind of an effort uh, next week. I'm just showing you how far you can actually take it and, and what amazing results you can actually get. And again, I guess the important thing is to have the courage of your conviction. I have put several times that I know of systems into production that were good decades later, decades plural. And technologies come and go. Every once in a while, somebody opens the lid, looks inside. Yeah, that's okay. Nothing to do here, right? You do it right. You do it once. It's pretty much good forever. Now, this is not going to be uh, well understood by your management and your colleagues, okay? And I can tell you a story here. In, I told you that in late 90s, I was the chief software architect of a Fortune 100 company. And once or twice a year, I had to do a presentation to the board. And I did the presentation to the board and one of the board members asked me, so the so-called uh, architecture of yours, how long is it going to be good for? And I said, look, the answer I really want to give you is forever, but forever is a very long time. Maybe the company would completely change its nature. I'm willing to put my name next to 20 years, one human generation. Two years ago, I did the architects masterclass in San Jose, Silicon Valley, where I still reside. And the slide I showed you there from the architects masterclass. And after I'm doing the presentation, during the break, somebody comes to me and says, hi, I'm a director from the old company. We're still using your architecture. So was I surprised? No, gratified, of course. And I have several uh, such stories. You do it right, you do it once, it's good forever, okay? You don't do it right, even endless amount of iterating over it later wouldn't fix it. Let's end this with some resources for you. The ideas I showed you today are uh, an appendix in my book, Writing Software, Note the Spelling, Writing, as in fixing, standing up correctly. 
And they actually rely on having the right architecture. Having contract factoring on a poor architecture is completely pointless. You have to get the architecture right, and then you can do the contract factoring. I mentioned to you the master classes I conduct. I conduct uh, two master classes, the architects master class and the advanced architects master class, which talks more about the process and the project you need to do to support these ideas. I'm going to be conducting the, architects, the advanced architects master class in the near future, once in California and in January uh, in Israel. And I'm going to conducting the Arctic's Masterclass next time in April in uh, California.